Like a wicked nightmare, Pittsburgh resident Ron Adams saw a terrifying vision as he drove home late one night before the first ever monster bash. And I was driving home one night and I'm passing uh, a, a mall, Westmoreland Mall on Route 30 coming home and there's a marquee that's talking about since it was winter time, a, a spring fashion show. And me being a lifelong classic monster movie fan, my brain twisted that into, boy, that would be cool if that marquee said Karloff, Lugosi, and Cheney appearing here instead of spring fashion show. The idea sprang to life in 1997 when Adams contacted the U.S. Postal Service about hosting the East Coast unveiling of a new set of stamps honoring classic Universal monsters, and thus began the annual tradition that became the Monster Bash. Since then, the annual Fright Fest has happened every year, most recently in Mars, Pennsylvania, just outside of Pittsburgh, drawing fans, movie stars, and horror film hosts from around the country. I started as a, as a young kid ordering the silent 8mm movies out of the Famous Monsters of Filmland magazine. I grew up in Chicago, so I, I was watching uh, Ch Chalk Theater, 1957, with Marvin. Shock Theater is an important turning point in the evolution of today's monster culture. In the late 1950s, the classic 1930s Universal monster films were getting kind of creaky. But when they were re-released to TV stations under the Shock Theater banner in the 50s, stations snapped up the cheap programming for late night replays, and the horror film host was born. Well, I've been uh, 27 consecutive years. I've never had a break or a week off. And I believe at this point that I may be the longest running costumed horror host in the entire country. We're sitting around uh, watching movie opens, you know, and up came this thing said Night of Terror. And I kind of blurted out, that's what we need, a horror host. And the general manager turned around and said, you're hired. I go, what am I doing? <laughs> From the late 50s until the late 1980s, horror hosts held forth on TV stations around the U.S., including Cleveland's legendary Goulardi, as well as Big Chuck and Houlihan, and later Big Chuck and Little John. All right, babies, I tell you, you can't see this from the way out there. But by the late 80s, the horror host was swiftly being stuffed back into their coffin and buried outside of broadcast TV. For a while there, in the, in the late 80s, the horror host kind of disappeared off of broadcast television. But they didn't disappear. They moved to cable access. So you had a, a kind of a renaissance there. And then after, in the early 2000s, after people saw that you, know, you could do it on the internet, uh, there were more and more people there were, and actually I would say right now within the past five years there's been a, a blossoming of people no one's gonna make any money off of this I mean this is something that you must love to do one of those 21st century horror hosts with a love for the biz is Mr. Lobo. I worked at an ABC TV station and they had a terrible movie at 3 in the morning that ran 20 minutes short every Saturday night and I walked into the general manager's office and I said, you got this movie that runs 20 minutes short and you've got these six minute commercial breaks. Have you ever tried to sit through a six minute commercial break? Especially when you're not selling any commercials at three in the morning. It's just the same four promos over and over again. And they didn't care, which was the best freedom ever. And I developed the format of the show and I created Mr. Lobo and uh, started doing, we did two for two years on ABC. Lobo's monstrous creation is called Cinema Insomnia, and it's been on TV and online ever since. One of several 21st century horror hosts still dredging up the dead nearly 60 years after the first release of Shock Theater. But today's hosts can no longer rely on the universal classics. As distribution and copyright rules have tightened, today's hosts 
are forced to go after different kinds of films. We're, we're running, uh, we're running uh, just Class Z movies. I mean, every one of them guaranteed Academy Award loser. Guaranteed. If you know a star in it, I'll be, I'd be amazed. Ah, these movies are so bad. Still, there's a fan base all across the U.S. and worldwide that follows the horror hosts of today like a zombie army. People like their local host as much as they do their internet host, but if they like to see their local host also on the internet so they can reach him or her, because I love the lady host, <laughs> Any, anytime, anywhere. Today's horror hosts also find themselves in demand on the circuit. In fact, Monster Bash is just one of the annual conventions that happen all across the country every year. While you sit at home watching football, nearly every weekend thousands of fans travel across the U.S. to meet their fright film heroes and shake hands with today's hosts. And those fans, says Mr. Lobo, are not, well, normal. It's a certain kind of kid that always finds these movies. And it's the indoor kids. It's not the popular kids. Okay? The nerdy kids like this stuff. People who appreciate these movies are sensitive, smart, girly men. And, and nobody wants that market. I'm so sad. <laughs> I'm a sensitive, <laughs> smart, girly man. <laughs> come, man. Come here, you big man, baby. Come on. It's so sad, man. It's all right. And I, I love it. I, I, I love... I love the genre, I love the people involved. <laughs> In Cleveland, Ohio, horror fans routinely line up every October for Goularty Fest, another gathering of ghouls who are loyal follower of Cleveland TV horror host legend Ernie Anderson's Goularty, as well as his progeny Big Chuck and Houlihan. And like the bash, as fans call it, Goularty Fest organizer Ron Garstek says the monsters of Goularty Fest are just misunderstood, not misanthropes. Uh, getting guest entertainment, uh, um, vendors is a big thing, you know, and trying to explain, you know, how much, you know, people come and and uh, it's it's been it's a, it's a fun thing, you know. Like people who are horror hosts, it's like. Everyone with a camera is a filmmaker. Everyone with a computer is a designer. And everyone with a bad Dracula cape is a horror host. But it's not just horror hosts who attend Monster Bash each year. Hundreds of fans haunt the show floor looking for an autograph, a collectible, or a chance to talk to their heroes. Pittsburgh native Tom Savini is one of the stars of Monster Bash. After winning awards for his makeup and effects work in films like Dawn of the Dead and Friday the 13th, he says he loves Monster Bash because it takes him back to his favorites growing up. For me, you know, I'm 66 years old. I grew up with the old monsters, you know. Not today with Twilight and the sparkly vampires kind of thing, you know. I'm really partial to the old ones. I would have used a different word, but, you know, I'd be at PBS. Um, so that's what this is all about, you know? But the bash is, that's what the bash, it's just, you don't make any money here, it's just charming to be here. That's why I come, yeah. Plus I live 20 minutes away. <laughs> Always helps. Yeah, that helps. Monster Bash fans also line up to see George Cassana, another Pittsburgh native who starred in the original Night of the Living Dead. Uh, no, we're all right. Okay. I made uh, eight pictures all together. I'm about to do a ninth if it ever happens, because a convention here came up to my table, said, I'm writing a screenplay. When it's finished, you're in it. I'm going to send you a copy of the script and a contract. And I'm still waiting. <laughs> <laughs> Edward Douglas is founder of Midnight Syndicate. And chances are, if you've heard any really good scary music lately, you've been listening to his work. For Douglas, the bash is a way to get feedback from fans. This is my opportunity to meet with the fans and get their feedback on the album, or just get that, I think all artists like to hear, you know, positive feedback and that little, get that little extra uh, encouragement to keep going forward. And, uh, and that's, what, that's another thing that these conventions give me, which is great. That's why I love doing them. 
This, the Monster Bash show, I like it a lot because it's vintage 60s, 50s and 60s. It's not a mixture of everything from then to now. It's very much back in the Ab Abbott Costello, uh, the Munsters type of thing. So I did most of my work in the 60s, so I'm in my comfort zone here. It's really, as a, somebody who's doing this for the first time, it's really a thrilling place to be. It's very cool so far. <laughs> Artist Tyler Peck mans his booth, chatting with fans and trying to create a buzz for his work, which integrates the classic Universal monsters in a modern way. And meanwhile, across from Peck's booth, you'll find this guy. Well, not this guy. He's the work of this guy, Cortland Hull. Since the 1970s, Hull, who is the nephew of Werewolves of London star Henry Hull, has operated the Witch's Dungeon Classic Movie Museum in Connecticut and he trots out his works to conventions all across the U.S. showing off his skills at creating monster mayhem. I've made these life-size accurate figures of the different classic movie monsters, so I don't know if they want me or my monsters. So <laughs> For Kevin Scarpino, who works as the son of ghoul in the Cleveland TV market, the bash also gives him a chance to trot out his collection of Three Stooges film shorts and monster movies. As the films unspool in the screening rooms at the Monster Bash, the show floor begins to fill up as people from all over the U.S. arrive in Mars, Pennsylvania. Some are dressed in costume, some sporting stacks of their favorite photos. Now, if you sat outside the convention site and watched the hearses pull up in the parking lot, you might expect to see a real collection of oddballs. But the folks who attend the Monster Bash say they don't see it that way at all. They say it's really just a big family reunion maybe like the Adams family or the monsters, but still, it's family. <laughs>fans who attend Monster Bash come from all over the U.S. and in all ages. But to former Munster star Pat Priest, who played Marilyn in the 1960 sitcom about a family of monsters, she sees the connection and understands why fans at Monster Bash get so nostalgic about the show. While we were different, we were a functional family. You know, Uncle Herman went to work, Grandpa went to work, Eddie went to school, I went to school, we had all of our meals together. Even though we were strange, we were kind of a normal family. That's one thing about the Munsters, it's multi-generational. Uh, grandparents, parents, and their grandkids are all watching it together. There's not a lot of shows that can actually keep the interest of three generations. And it has family values. The kids like it. Uh, they like it for the visual effects. And then they're getting the family values and the sort of like an undertone. It has a lot of social commentary that people aren't aware of. It's like the Munsters were like, you know, don't, you don't want to live next door to the Munsters until you get to know them. And then once you get to know them, you love them. So it's the type of thing, don't judge a book by its cover. So there's a lot of sneaky little things going on there. Take a step onto the show floor at the Monster Bash and you'll quickly find the fans' connection to the show often has family ties as well. My family's been going pretty much since Monster Bash started, um, so I, I can't even remember. Uh, that's how long we've been coming. It's been more, of a, more or less a, a tradition. Uh, just every summer, it's always Monster Bash. It's like We always set aside that weekend. It was always something that our family did. For the Spisak family, the Bash is a long-standing tradition. I had a set of the stamps and then I was reading something about them and um, I heard about this convention. So we came that year and we've been every year since. We've actually been coming, my family and I, for 17 years. I think we only missed the first two Monster Bashes. Um, so I've been coming since I was like nine. The, the people here are friendly and uh, you know, it, it just, it is a weird crowd of people. It's a different crowd. I guess not for the average person. You really have to be into it. There's no in-between. You're either into this stuff or you're not into it. And all I can say, if you're not into it, just stay away. We don't want your raggedy ass here, okay? So, am I allowed to say that? Yes, there's some people that are a little over the top, shall we say, but then there's other very wonderful people that you meet. The relationship between stars and fans might seem awkward from the outside. Stars sitting at tables and selling photos and signatures, and one might think fans would be reluctant to plunk down their money for a handshake or an 8x10, but you'd be wrong. We wouldn't be here without them, you know, so 
you're here to play with them, mingle with them, you know, smoke a cigar outside with some of them, chat. They don't get to do that very often, you know. I, I think of my, I'm just a guy from Pittsburgh, you know. I'm still in the house I was born and raised in. So um, it's not anything uh, special to uh, talk to strangers, you know. Plus you sit there and they throw money at you all day, you know, so. The common fallacy is the fans feel they owe us. Now, as Russell Striner says, and I borrow from him, the fans do not owe us. They went to see that movie. They paid for the tickets. We owe them. And in trying to give the fans back something, we appear at these conventions. I thought I'll go once and I'll just sort of play along. And, and like Autumn said, it was just amazing the way the people are so friendly and the question and answers and you get to meet Boris Karloff's daughter, which was quite an honor for me because I love Boris. Um, so just that type of stuff that brings us back. Um, have grandkids coming now, which is exciting. Like this is what I grew up with. Like all the old monster movies and Boris and Bella, like that's what I grew up with. So when my dad found out about this, you know, we came and loved it. Like now it's like a family reunion. Every day, you know, we come every year and you just see all these people you know and everyone's so approachable and friendly. You're here at a convention uh, celebrating something that you all have in common. So you could be sitting down at the bar afterwards or just hanging around or just sitting at your booth and talking to somebody and strike up a conversation because you all have this familiarity with whatever it is. And like this, it's classic horror films. So you can sit down and have a conversation with anybody in here about you know, their favorite universal horror film or their favorite Hammer horror film. And that's cool, and so you have that connection. But no, uh, the people at these, at these shows are really just another one of the reasons that I love doing it. And every show, towards the end of the show, someone and multiple people will come up and say, you know, this was just the best way to meet people like me. And that, that's what I'm, I'm happy to do, and to have a, a venue for, for like people to get together. I think you, you, you know, we became what we are now simply because of all of our fans and people that have always supported us and, and, and you, you don't realize it until you come out to one of these shows. I feel like I've always been a person that's been a little bit out of my era, which is maybe why I come to these things. I appreciate, I guess, the genuine nature of horror and people just throwing something together that's purely from their imaginations and it's charming it's charming it's refreshing and I love it so that's why I'm here um, so this is kind of a I, I take it as a cleansing of the palate uh, because I come to these conventions every year to the Monster Bash, as a matter of fact, specifically because it's such a, a departure from the world at large. It's a land of innocence and fun and I can be six years old again and I really enjoy that. The fans, people were coming up saying, you know, it's nice to get together. It's nice for a place, you know, for everyone that grew up in the 60s and 70s liking this stuff to get together and hang out. And so. Monster Bash is really just a hangout or a family picnic, we like to think of it as, uh, for classic monster fans. Just getting together and talking, and talking about, about horror films or, or whatever the convention's about. But here it's going to be horror films and, and great classic films, and that's funny. That's fun, and, it, and we do, there's, yes, there's lots of debates and, uh, and, and, and good, uh, good talk to be had, so it's good. <laughs> it's been great, you know, all, all these friendships I made across the country going to these conventions. There's a camaraderie, community, that I can rely on, that I can come to this convention being into weird stuff. Monster film, being a young guy that's into monster films, I mean, it sounds, you know, kind of silly, but it's, a, it's actually a little daunting because you can come to a convention and yet you can, there's a camaraderie and a community. Sometimes that bonding can get very personal. A young lady came to my table in Dallas, Texas. She says, I want your autograph. I don't want to buy a picture. I don't have a piece of paper for you to sign. I said, well, how are we going to do this? And she whipped out her left breast and said, sign this. <laughs> so I did. And as an afterthought, I called her back and above my name, I wrote, hi. <laughs> of course, the classic universal monster films of the 1930s and 40s are receding into the past, as are the old school horror hosts. 
And despite seeing some of the young attendees at Monster Bash, one has to wonder if one day even the Mummy and Dracula will simply turn to dust as a new day of scary films dawns. The historical significance of old horror movies is basically dependent on a niche market. The mainstream public doesn't care much for the old horror movies because it's black and white. It's a mentality, technology changes. Kids today, they want to play on their Palm Pilots, they want to browse the internet. Anything old black and white isn't cool to them, but sometimes they get into the field, it's a niche market. Still, for budding horror fans and artists like Tyler Peck, being part of a niche market suits them just fine. As a dream, I would love to do a cover of a horror magazine. I don't know if that will happen in five years. I hope it does. But, you know, I'll continue to come to these conventions and we'll see. Even monsters change. Time passes and Pat Priest, who played Marilyn on the Munsters, sees the change from behind her table. I had a little boy come up to my table and he's staring at me and staring at me and finally he looks up and he says, are you Marilyn? And I go, yes, I'm Marilyn. Well, you don't look like her. Okay, I mean, maybe he saw it, you know, on, on TV Land an hour ago or whatever. Uh, no, I don't, and I have to try and explain to them. That was almost 50 years ago. And then, of course, I laugh and I say, what well, would you believe if I said I was Marilyn's grandma? And they go, yes, and I say, okay, I'm Marilyn's grandma, and I'm selling these pictures for Marilyn, the autographs. <laughs> Horror hosts like Son of Ghoul run into similar problems. As TV moved into the high-definition world over the past decade, the grainy old black-and-white films have an ever harder uphill climb. Producer asked me one day, he said, how come you still shoot your show like analog and stuff? He said, how come you're not high tech? He says, is it because of the look? And I said, no, it's because I can't afford high tech equipment. That's why. But for some fans, the old monster films were their first exposure to the world of the macabre. You know, and as a little kid, you don't really watch new scary movies because they're too gory. So with something like Dracula and Frankenstein, like, we're always allowed to watch that. Like, there is never anything threatening or like, oh, wait, you can't watch that scene. So like growing up from a little kid, it's just very familiar and comforting, I think, at this point. After nearly 30 years of donning his paper goatee, the son of ghoul, Kevin Scarpino, is amazed that fans still turn out for him. I didn't think it would last 13 weeks. You never know when you're doing the show how you're perceived by people out there. You know, you just don't know the impact or you don't realize it until many, many years later and you come out and you do a show like this and you're going, whoa, you know. Oh, they loved the show. Oh, it was so important. And to find out what an important part that it played in a lot of people's lives. Despite changing times and tastes, it seems that monster fans will continue to devour old school films like Ghost of Frankenstein and The Mummy. The people who really like horror will school their children and their offspring and their children's children in the classics. The fans keep the hobby going. So the studios want the fans to be interactive. They want the conventions to keep them buying merchandise because that's where it sells besides the internet. It helps out with keeping them, I guess, the spirit of old movies and old TV shows alive. And so, of course, no gathering of monster maniacs would end without the requisite question being asked. What is the best monster film of all time? As far as classic monster movies, it's it's Frankenstein, 1931, the first Karloff. As far as monster movies, that's it. I'm going to Costello meet Frankenstein because it has Dracula. And there's um, Young Frankenstein because that was very, very funny. The Creature from the Black Lagoon was always my favorite. <laughs> the Day the Earth Stood Still with Patricia Neal. Sam Jaffe is just wonderful in, in that. Uh, Dracula. I didn't have a Lego Dracula watch. 
for me, the Creature of the Black Lagoon. I enjoy Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein, all from Universal Studios. I think The Day the Earth Stood Still is one of the best films that 20th Century Fox came out during that calendar year. Um, the Blob from 1958. Bride of Frankenstein. In the end, whether you're talking to a horror host, a fan, or a film star, they all say the same thing keeps them trekking across the U.S. to shows like Monster Bash. It's that behind all the lightning, graveyards, and scars beats the heart of someone who just really, really wants to be scared. When you're, in the, when you're behind the scenes, you've destroyed the magic that I talked about, seeing a movie through the eyes of an eight-year-old child. It's replaced by the magic of creativity, you know. But that magic of believing everything, you know, so... Uh, um, but in Alien and The Exorcist, not one of those thoughts went through my head. I was too busy being scared. It's very rare when a movie sucks you in like that, you know, and, and those two did it. I wasn't thinking of, I was totally engulfed. I was eight years old again, you know. I was believing everything I saw. Well done.